Good morning, and welcome to the latest edition in our series, Leadership Lessons in Troubled Times. These free online fireside chats are brought to you by the Schulich Executive Education Center, or SEEK. My name is Robert Lind, Associate Director at SEEK and moderator of today's session, The Heart of Resilient Leadership, The Future of Work is Human. Our guest is Zabine Herji, Executive Advisor on the Future of Work at Deloitte. She is also a member of the Board of Directors of Sleep Country Canada and Board Chair of Civic Action. She has been an advisor to the Clerk of the Privy Council for the Government of Canada on Diversity and Inclusion and was a top executive at RBC where she was Chief Human Resources Officer and Board Chair at RBC Foundation. Sabine will be interviewed this morning by my colleague, Alan Middleton, SEEK's Executive Director. If you would like to ask questions during the session, please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of your computer screen, and we'll try to ask as many questions as time permits. We are recording this session for those who are unable to attend the session live. Now, let's get started. Um, over to my colleague, Alan Middleton. Thank you, Robert. It's an absolute delight to welcome Sabine to this chat. Um, and there are two things that I find interesting about Sabine, um, which is the, the depth of her background at such a young age, such senior positions and such important elements right now. And uh, the title about resilience, which is certainly what's needed at the moment. But uh, on the board of Sleep Country Canada, I can only assume that she gets such wonderful beds from Sleep Country she gets so rested, that uh, adds to the dynamic during the rest of the day. So welcome, Zabine. Thank you, um, um, Alan. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here with you and with, uh, with the viewers today. Yeah. Yeah. So let's start off, uh, we'll, we'll phase it in, in a couple of ways. Let's start off with the present, and then we'll move on to the future. Because the present, um, as you know, and everybody knows, Toronto has just joined Ontario, except for Windsor moving into stage two. Um, so a number of people can be back at work, although most people still not at work, still working from home virtually. So the environment is, is changing and mixing. So in this environment, what, what tips and thoughts do you have for us? And we work virtually until we get to the, the full, everybody gets a choice to be back at work stage. And we'll talk about the future in a second. So. How are you seeing things? Yeah, um, thank you. So in terms of this next phase, and that's why I like to use the term next normal as opposed to new normal, because we're going to have a few nexts, and maybe yeah. that's actually the way, the way of the future, uh, so that we, the mindset shifts from we're going to go to something that's fixed to one that's going to be continually, uh, continually changing. So in terms of work from home, like, Many people, you and I are good examples. We're sitting in, in our homes here. And, and of course, that will continue. It is important to, to say that with in, in April, the Statistics Canada data showed that about just over 40% of people were working from home. So there are a lot of people that are not able to work from home. So we are talking about a particular segment. And... Um, it people have already formed some of the habits i think they say it takes 60 days to form a, ha a new habit and so we have become uh, quite accustomed to it but i think we also have to start to pay attention to uh, some of the uh, there are lots of uh, advantages and pros and there are also disadvantages and one of the things that i think about is isolation mm. people are feeling isolated, the need for social, uh, social contact, certainly with the weather better and some of the opening up, people will be able to go outside more, but work is an anchor for many of us around that and how we are paying attention to that as, as employers and as communities will, I think, now become more important as we go past this 90-day do you think, do you think that will stick? Because you're absolutely right. A lot of um, talk now about, you know, mental health because of these issues. You, more so maybe with people who are retired, but, but even those without families um, working from home. Um, is that something employees are going to have to spend more attention to? 
absolutely. And what we're also seeing is young people are very affected mm -hmm. by this. We know that youth and young people are more um, impacted by mental health. This is pre-COVID. Yep. But if you stop to think about, especially in areas like the GTA and, and the, 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 the Toronto in, in the kind of downtown core, there are a lot of young people who live there now and they walk to work and work is where they get the social connection mm. and they've actually lost that. Absolutely. And so it, it is, and I'm already seeing, it's very encouraging to see organizations paying more attention to mental health support. And there are two aspects to it. One of them is really the, the access to professional health services and, and support through benefits programs. The really important piece though is the culture. Mm. How do you create the culture where mental health is normalized mm. and uh, it, it's not something that's stigmatized, which is still the case as, as Cam H says, mental health is health and uh, that comes through storytelling people sharing their own experiences senior people sharing their ex mm -hmm. experiences that's the kind of thing that i'm also seeing this more human relationship mm -hmm. uh, that uh, leaders are forming with uh, with their with uh, their staff and you know just to finish off this section in perhaps what's happening in this next mode i was speaking with a group of uh, cfos in bc this was a, a group of deloitte clients and one of the cfos said you know i know we've talked about communication forever in a day but i now see how important it is and i and he said i set aside half an hour every day to speak to two of my staff one on one and to really understand how things are going how they're feeling, how can I support them personally through, uh, through really the, some of the issues like we're talking about now around, around health, mental health, mental well-being, and also to be more productive because it's not a one-size-fits-all and people have different, um, yeah. different needs to make yeah. working from home. It's, it's one of the themes we're hearing through this, this whole chat session so we've been doing, which is, the importance of senior management connection with the front line, mm -hmm. whether they're working from home or whether they're working in stores or in, in hospitals. Is, can that compression of the hierarchy actually sustain? Yeah. Because you're absolutely right. It's not just about their health. It's about listening to the people in the front lines and listening to their ideas and innovations as well, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You've made some really, really important points. So, what we've seen happen in terms of communication is what I call radical transparency. That's, that's very different where leaders are telling employees and even more broadly where they're serving customers, they're, they're, they're talking about what they know and what they don't know. We're seeing that even with our um, health officials or our, our medical officers where they often start by saying, I don't have all the answers, yep. here's what I know. And that kind of transparency and willingness to admit that I don't have all the answers really builds trust. We, that connects us at that very human level and you then feel and act as one team. I think that that has to continue. We've, yeah. That train has left the station and I, leaders are seeing how it's actually working it's having an impact on performance on engagement on productivity and they've overcome some of the early the early challenges to start to do that is really hard but once you get into that mode you see how it's working and you see the feedback and i speak very personally as a leader myself where i went through a phase uh, a few years ago of really getting comfortable with that kind of style and boy once you start you realize that it completely changes the relationship and, and uh, connection so this breaking down of hierarchies that is an acceleration of what was happening mm -hmm. already in in certainly in um, perhaps not in all uh, sectors uh, here I would speak more to my experience in the private sector, but even in governments that uh, where, where I was seeing that, 
where people were starting to move from this hierarchy of level or title to hierarchy of knowledge. And because we've had to solve problems with a lot of urgency through the, this period, it was natural for leaders to go to where the answers were most, most likely point. to come yeah. from and to crowdsource uh, ideas. And again, seeing how it's working, I was just uh, with a, a CHRO of a couple of very large organizations yesterday, and they were talking about how this has, has really changed. But what it means, the, the, the parallel change required there for it to stick, as a leader, you have to also be more willing to give up control. Mm. And to move from, and this is Adam Grant's um, language that I'm using here, but to move from micromanagement yep. to macro management. Absolutely. You set the context, you set the direction, and then you let people go. Absolutely. But, but along with that Adam. comes, and, and I, I'm going to put a little bit of a negative in for a second to allow you to go for the positive. Along with that comes training and development of our people. Mm -hmm. So that those front line, that flattened hierarchy, that trust we give out, and I couldn't agree more with you. We need to train people better. And Canada does not have a good record on this. I'm just going to quote some numbers. Mm -hmm. um, according to the World Talent Ranking of the World Competitiveness Handbook, we're number 22 out of 63 in the world in the importance placed on employee training. Um, the top ones have been the Scandinavians and Germany um, and even China and Japan coming up. And even in the other international survey, the World Economic Forum, its global competitiveness report, um, puts us number 22 in the world on the extension of staff training. So we, we haven't put our money where our mouth is in the past. Do you think that can change? Because that upgrading of skills is so critical. Yeah, so absolutely, and then those numbers have been pretty consistent with OECD numbers as well. In the case of OECD, Canada is somewhere in the middle. So I would respond to this in two ways. The, uh, the half glass full and the half, uh, the, half glass, uh, the half glass, the glass half empty. <laughs> have a drink. OECD, the half empty first. And, uh, and absolutely, when you look at those numbers, they are low and we need to see businesses step up and really incorporate and training uh, in a similar way that we, that we move to uh, health and wellness benefits being part of really being table stakes. Mm. Those are there to help people stay healthy and when and they're healthy, they're productive in the workplace as well. The, the learning side is, is actually to help people ultimately stay healthy as well, because it's about jobs, it's about not having, you know, having more confidence that they will be able to adapt, they'll be able to uh, take on new roles. And so it, it has to become much more of a, it, it, it's not a nice to have, it's a need to have. So, there, I also see opportunities for government and uh, uh, educational institutions and uh, organizations and employees mm -hmm. to actually play uh, a different kind of a role. Because not all organizations are the same. My history comes from a large organization, uh, a, a bank, where that, that is something that's easier for them to do. They've got a different kind of resource base to, um, to, to work with. I also think that as workers, we have a different role to play. And this is where lifelong learning yep. is, is, uh, certainly gets talked about. And, um, and I, it's certainly something I personally believe in. I, I have retired from my full on, full time, one job career to be doing many different things, but I'm constantly, I'm constantly um, learning. But the way I like to think about it is back to the health and, and mm. wellness. You, you go, once you finish university, you don't stop your health and wellness activities. They are lifelong. And trust me, the older you get, <laughs> the more you actually need Absolutely. it. You, you'll eventually find out. Not yet. 
<laughs> and so for me, how do you make learning part of the DNA and how do you build public private support structures to really enable that? Uh, very quickly on the glasses half full, mm. here there is a, in, in my mind, there is also some uh, modernization of the data required. Mm. And what I mean by that, it captures formal training dollars mm. spent. It doesn't capture on the job learning. Right, no. Nope. Um, it doesn't capture on the time that people spend learning online, and there's so many online yep. platforms. Or attending and conferences, so, conferences and debriefing people on the way back. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yep. the, the, the um, how to, we, we need the, the data to mm. capture some of that because on the job experiences is really mm. um, very critical, and what's under leveraged. Uh, for for certainly for business leaders in the audience is internal mobility. Yep, absolutely. Moving people around more frequently is the best way to learn and develop new skills. And uh, I was fortunate in my career to to move from retail banking to operations mm -hmm. to tech to credit cards to HR, and uh, that is the the probably the biggest learning accelerator but that never gets captured anywhere. The, the investment that the organization is making and saying, you know what, we're prepared that that person's going to take an extra three months to get up to speed, but we know the payback Absolutely. is going to come. In, in fact, a very famous corporation um, used to have a nickname internally, IBM, was often called by its employees, I'd be moved, because IBM put so much emphasis on training, mm -hmm. retraining, and moving people around. Mm -hmm. um, in this world of the future, you know, part of what's being talked about now is um, inclusion and diversity mm -hmm. as, as issues with obviously indigenous peoples, uh, black lives, and a number of these, which has raised our awareness of the need to address this. Um, because those are also sources of innovation and talent that Perhaps we haven't been paying enough attention to. How do you see that evolving in the future yeah, of work? Yeah. Well, you know, that is an area that I have been uh, involved in and a champion of for, for many uh, decades, uh, actually. And um, so you're right. We have made progress in some areas. We have a long mm. way to go. And what we're seeing through through this pandemic, and some of it, I think, has come come from the, the experience in the pandemic, we've seen people unite around common predicament, common purpose. Mm. And globally uh, come together and say, this needs to change. Uh, so that's the, that's the starting point. Business leaders, institutional leaders are, are certainly uh, turning up their, uh, the, the focus, the attention, and really starting to look at uh, inclusion, I think, in a, in a more disaggregated way. It's, it's not, there's so many different aspects that, that are involved. So if I bring it to the Canadian context, this is the time for us to really move at COVID time, mm -hmm. is what I think about work from home virtually overnight, 40% of people were working from home. Mm. We could have never imagined. We could have never planned for something like that. There would have been so many obstacles. Oh, we need more data. Oh, we need to figure this out. Oh, we need to do a pilot. Guess what? No time for that. We'll do it and yeah. we'll figure it out. Yeah. And we'll iterate and we'll, we'll build the, the, the relationships and the trust and we'll figure it out together. And so... I think it's absolutely essential for organizations and individuals, I, I do want to say a word about individuals, uh, to, to listen and learn, but we need to move in taking action in tandem. There are many no regrets actions mm -hmm. that don't require more data. Mm -hmm. They need to be tangible and they need to be genuine. Mm -hmm. And I'm encouraged by, by what I'm seeing, but we can't lose momentum because to your point, uh, I talk about building a future of work that works for all. And that's not 
the all is not just the individuals. Mm -hmm. When it works for individuals, it works for organizations and it works for our country. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. It is an absolute win-win. And uh, now it's become more mainstream. It's more, we talked about normalizing mental health, for example. It's moving much more to the, to the C-suite level. Uh, but let's not lose the, the momentum. If I could maybe just say something mm -hmm. at a personal level, because a lot of the institutional organizational issues, we're talking about systemic uh, racism and systemic discrimination. We as individuals can also have a huge impact. Mm -hmm. You know, we, I step back and, and I've been, I've been reading a lot of posts and, and, and articles and books and really to build my own knowledge. And one of the things that is really, really clear is that this is also about the heart, not just the head. And so the systemic barriers are about the head. And if we all were to step back and say, what am I doing that is, it's not enough to say I'm not a racist. It's what we need to be is anti-racist. Mm -hmm. and, and that's very different. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are we doing in our day-to-day -day behaviors, in our day-to-day -day interactions? It's those subtle things, the, su the subtle sometimes called microaggressions, that have a cumulative effect on people. Mm -hmm. It's not a, you know, sometimes you hear people saying, oh, you're just making a big deal. It's just a one time. No, when this has happened over and over mm -hmm. again, it's, it's exponential. And, um, and I'll close here with my, my favorite, one of my favorite quotes from mm -hmm. Maya um, Angelou on this topic. And she says, yeah. people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did but people will never forget how you made them feel. And we all can make people feel differently. Absolutely. It, it, it's interesting because not only in this context, but in, in general, one of the things we've been hearing in some of my activities is as we've had the online world, you've had the kids walk in the background. You've had the family walk in. You've had the dogs and the cats or in one uh, not-for-profit I'm involved in, a donkey, because she's chair of a donkey organization. <laughs> and all of, it's suddenly humanizing, and people have talked about understanding the person as more whole human mm -hmm. than just the, um, uh, the, the, the work role. Again, is that something we can mm -hmm. continue? You're saying we have to. It's that human instinct you talked about. Yeah, I... I, first of all, absolutely, we have to, we have to continue. And uh, there will be pressure to, to go back uh, to, to the past. But think about it, that this crisis is the worst that most of us have ever experienced. Yeah. And it worked in a crisis. Yep. So imagine how much, how it could work in different circumstances. When we weren't, when we're not dealing with everything that comes mm -hmm. that comes with, with the crisis, I've been doing a lot of uh, convening and conversing with uh, with people actually mostly online through through LinkedIn chats that, that I have, and people are saying things like, like the masks are off yeah. and how how much of a difference that makes. I love that. Yeah, because we don't realize how much energy goes into hiding some part of who we mm -hmm. are and taking away from productivity and performance. And once people get to know you and also get to see that it doesn't matter level, at the end of the day, we all have the same basic human desires and lives. Mm -hmm. Our children, our families, our, what's important to us, what things they may never have known about us. And it's become an equal it's shown us at that the connection at humanity is one that really takes away uh, many of the, uh, the, the, the aspects of, of people that are related to job or title or things that, that have come along the way as opposed to, uh, it, you know, if I think about diversity, what binds us is our similarities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What makes us stronger and makes us more innovative and 
um, and, uh, and, and productive is our differences. Yeah. And this allowed us to see those similarities regardless of what you look like, what religion you are, um, ability, uh, um, sexual orientation, all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, yeah. we have so much in common. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, just to feed in those, those awful two letters that a lot of us talk about, AI, Conceptually, and I'd, I'd like to move in towards the, the future of work. So I'm, I'm feeling some optimism here, which is AI enabling us to take out of some of the pure routinization of a lot of things that perhaps led us to treat people as sort of automatons doing jobs and look for them to be by use of the, the AI capabilities of data properly or machinery, um, using that to be more creative, more productive and therefore changing the, the way we think. So are we on to this new phase? Could we be on the brink of a move from the old industrial revolution, division of labor, very specific, we want you just to do what you would tell you to do, to a much broader, almost what I'd like to call Star Trek new generation kind of feeling. Uh, can we be there? So my answer to that is yes, if. So I want to talk about the Good. if. So Good. I think that the yes part is even something as simple as our smartphone. It's full of AI app, apps with, with AI, right? Um, and so, sometimes it's quite annoying, like spell check. It still, <laughs> you know, it still changes the bean. To, <laughs> so they, it, it needs some, some yep. um, expansion in diverse names. Um, so, and, and the thing is, it's pervasive. We don't even realize how much AI is already there because it's, it's behind the curtain and it, it does, it does make our lives simple. And it's not, it's, it's routine work, but it's also, um, work, at MRIs, for example, yep. are read by AI better than, um, um, than uh, radiologists. And what it means is the radiologist has to become, develop more human skills because now all of a sudden she has to engage with, with patients. She has the time to explain to the patients as opposed to just reading the MRI. Mm. So it really affects everyone. So my if, absolutely, we cannot fall into technological determinism. It, we can't let say, well, you know, technology is there, so we're gonna use it. It's us as humans, it's leaders, it's leaders across all sectors, actually thinking about the impact, how you stage it, how you develop people and upskill them so that they can uh, take on those higher value mm -hmm. jobs and roles. And there is going to be a transition. They, like with any industrial revolution, this fourth industrial re re uh, revolution will have a transition period and how we work together to manage through that. There will, we will require certain social supports uh, before we get to the other end, which really, uh, I think, leaves me at that, uh, leads me to this point of collaboration and uh, co-creation and, and across sectors and it has to be turbocharged. Mm -hmm. that, that's mm -hmm. how we're going to really manage that and optimize human-machine collaboration. Mm -hmm. So as we draw to the end, I, I, I got, we got, uh, the comments are, by the way, very complimentary, like beautifully phrased, so people are saying nice things about you. Um, but there's an interesting question from Kelly, um, which actually reflects back on part of the earlier conversation. If if you look to leaders to be clear about where things are going, and they are saying, I'm not sure, we'll have to wait and see, do you lose the confidence of your staff? No. No. Good. Um, no. And, and I think the reason I say that is you, you, you also have to give people hope and optimism. So it's not, I don't know, and the end of the conversation. Right but it's actually then trying to understand why are you asking that question? What is it that you're worried about? And it's, it, the discussions need to be get into much more depth as opposed to superficial mm -hmm. because there is no playbook for a pandemic. Yeah. Every, 
in this case, everybody knows that. But I think more broadly, post-pandemic, when you do that, people will actually contribute their ideas a lot more. And that's where inclusion comes into place. That's when you get really good at creating environments, systems, and just skills to be able to bring everyone into the conversation and, and meet them where they are because we all respond and engage in very different ways. And uh, a good leader, I think what's been added to, uh, to uh, again, talking yesterday to a couple of CHROs, to leadership competencies is empathy, uh, compassion, uh, inclusion are now really uh, very much top of the list Absolutely. for leaders. A, a survey done by uh, where you're currently involved, Deloitte, um, indicated that of really required skills, it was only analytics and AI, but also that leadership mentality and everything else. So I'm going to go to one last uh, question um, and then uh, last for a summary. And this is from Tyron. How can employees encourage senior leaders within an organization to see the employer-employee relationship as a two-way street? Good question, Tyrone. Thank you, Tyrone, for that really good question. And it is important because we all play a role and, and, and our work is, is, really, uh, is really important. So some top-of-mind ideas, get, get together with two or three like-minded like, uh, employees and put together a one-pager, because they're all busy, that really offers some solutions not don't focus on the problem the problem statement can be there or the opportunity statement can be there that we've seen through COVID how there has this this relationship has been changing and how it's been so effective and we have some ideas of what we can do in our in our organization that we have gathered from employees and I have found in my experience a lot of times managers and leaders are very open to that when there are solutions attached to it because you've made their job a lot easier. Excellent. So what I heard from you, and I'm going to come back to you and say just concluding thoughts, wonderful thought, which is upgrading skills and improving your capability is part of health and wellness, as, as, along with all the other really important things that we need to think about divergence and inclusion as not only a human thing to do and to recognize your own uh, biases, but mm -hmm. also critical for the innovation and in, in stuff we need for the future. And, and that what we need to do is to make sure the things we've learned through this period about thinking of people in more totally human ways and listening to them sticks and doesn't go back to, to the past. Any additional closing uh, thoughts from you? I think you've captured it well, and I would say as far as the learning, there's so much learning opportunity right now that is not being captured. Keep, keep a note of it. I was going to say you know, keep a diary, but keep a diary yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and of, of the learning so that you can come back to them. As employees feel empowered, be empowered to take the learnings, take forward to uh, to your your employers, what what things can be done, and if we're all playing a role in in that, and really seeing this, the the the, the for me one of the biggest takeaways that maybe we don't talk about as much, we have seen the human capacity to learn and to adapt in ways that we would have never thought possible. Right. The reason we are where we are today and how we've managed through is because every single person living in Canada played a part. We bought into the, 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 um, the objective. We were all united by this predicament and that has gotten us to where we are. So the power of the human capacity and, um, and spirit is for me the greatest uh, cause for optimism and hope and let's not lose it let's continue to work together 
and to really accelerate and, uh, and get to a lot of the things that we have not been able to for many decades. Sabine Herji, it's been an absolute delight. Thank you. And I'm going to hand back to Robert uh, to do his close and to add to the thank you. Robert. Alan, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for attending today's session. Please feel free to join us at our next Fireside Chat, Leadership Lessons from the Front Lines on J July 9th at 2 p.m. with retired General Andrew Leslie, former commander of the Canadian Army, business leader, and former member of parliament. He will share his leadership insights from the front lines of business, government, and the military during his distinguished 40-year professional career. Special thank you to Zabine for joining us today. Everyone, have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zabine. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Have a great summer. And you.